Wadawurrung people haven't made a canoe for well over a century or more. So t to me, it's all about learning those skills again so that we can do that. It's about bringing back those skills, bringing back that knowledge. I was reading all these accounts about um, how uh, white explorers wanted to uh, get across rivers and uh, they tried to make canoes and uh, they dismally failed. And so, you know, it, uh, it all came together that we would select a tree in Ballarat on Wathurung land and uh, we would make a canoe on Wathurung land and, and show, show the wider community, you know, sort of how, um, you know, how much fun it is and how terrific it is to enjoy Aboriginal technology. I've been out with, uh, with Luke and Sean for a couple of days looking at trees and then pre-cutting one yesterday. The process that I always do with selecting a tree is to look at the uniformity of the bark itself. Then you'll start to spot the imperfections because imperfections in the bark mean holes. So once that's selected, it's then marked. We do a rough outline. One key thing is the responsibility that I have to that tree. I have to look after it. It's my obligation because it's provided something really important to us. My old people survived for thousands of years by learning about the environment and becoming part of it so that as the environment changed, they changed. The thing that I see wrong is that people think they are a part of it, different from it. They try to control it, manage it, change it. I minimise the amount of stress on it, so I use um, Stanley knives, I use a tomahawk and a hammer to make those cuts a little bit more precise. Then once we cut it in and we cut a really large rectangle out of the tree itself is that we then pry it. So one of the rules that I have and that I try to pass on is that if you can't put your hands here beneath the bark and pry it off just using your hands and you'll feel the wetness there, then you're not doing it at the right time of the year. If we can get you know, a, a diameter tree sort of about like that, and we're only taken from here around, we're given um, that tree all the best chance to survive. So I take off as a maximum only 50% of the bark that's there. Whatever we do goes back to the environment. So nothing we do is a permanent effect. When we can no longer use that canoe, the bark rots down back into the ground, becomes part of the environment again. By taking the bark off, we're not harming the tree. We take account of um, the way the tree is facing, so that we take it off the north side, so it gets the sunlight, so it stops, stops the uh, moisture and the rot from happening on the tree, so the tree survives. Eventually, everything goes back to the ground. But man keeps making things that never break down never go back into the environment. You need fire to, to make a, a stringy bark canoe and uh, to mould it, uh, we, it required a certain amount of heat and not too much heat. And it's, it's quite a technical sort of process. We use fire to utilise the saps and the water that's left in the bark. So when we take it off the tree itself, we then heat up those saps um, and the moisture, the water in the bark, which allows us to have the bark malleable to fold into the ends that we do that we then tie up. Without the fire and without that heat to heat up that bark, we would just basically be split it if we tried to do the same thing without fire. You take a bit of bark off the tree, you don't want to reshape it too much. It has a natural boat shape. So all you want to do is just make it, strengthen it, seal it to make it waterproof so you can use it and bend the ends up. You don't make things difficult. By heating it up, like all saps resins, it'll heat to a certain point and then once it cools down, it crystallises again. So once it crystallises on the cool down, it actually forms the seal within the bark. And that is our sealant that keeps it afloat and keeps it from being waterlogged. 
So we utilise the outer bark and it acts as an insulator so we don't, I guess, cook that sap too quickly. Now, once that's taken off, that inner bark then was used by the women to make twine. So it was a community event. And then you would have had the younger ones there watching intently because as they got older, it would have been their obligation then to learn that, master that, and then pass that on again in the same, that same cycle. Did you notice what was happening with those guys around that canoe? Did you notice the smiles on their face, the talking, the laughter? It wasn't work. It was socialising. It was having fun. And that's what it always was. Living should be fun. Work should never be a burden. We've treated the bark itself, but then we still have gaps in the ends. So then what we do is we use um, our natural clay, so for us pipe clay, and we use that to basically just bog up the ends to make it watertight. So your average one from historical accounts was a two-person canoe, which usually was a husband and wife, with the women fishing with um, hand line and hook, and the men with a spear. When you think back to pre-settlement and the size of the trees that we're dealing with, the thickness of the barks that we're dealing with, um, in all possibility you could have made uh, larger, bigger canoes to carry more people. What comes out as a, as a simple construction but actually is really a, um, a complex uh, process and a, and a complex product. So we see in every single uh, state of, of Australia the use of Aboriginal technology was very quickly embraced by, by white people. They saw that it was uh, the, the only way in many cases. And particularly in the Gold Rush period, you know, here in Ballarat. Probably without the canoes, the Gold Rush in Ballarat may have been different. Because when those miners came into Geelong and Melbourne, they had to cross the rivers. It was Aboriginal people that made canoes and ferried those people and their goods across the rivers. You know, white people were using this technology, this Aboriginal technology for, for decades and decades, and they really admired this technology. And then um, in the 20th century, we um, just sort of wrote it out of the history books. I think we've got a really, really big responsibility now to reawaken, you know, the, the ingenious um, way our old people did things. You know, you don't have to have fancy high-tech stuff and our old people didn't have fancy high-tech stuff for hundreds of thousands of years. Look, don't get me wrong, it's great to have technology, but don't get so immersed in it that it takes over your life. To me, that's a means to an end. The environment is more important because with it, if the environment stuffs up, we're all stuffed and there'll be no need for technology. So you've got to have a balance. <laughs>